Welcome to this week. This week, we start on a sad note, following the death of a former UN Secretary General, Boutros Boutros Ghali. Boutros Ghali, who was Secretary General from 1992 to 1996, died at the age of 93. In a speech on Tuesday, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon hailed his predecessor Boutros Boutros Ghali as a respected statesman who brought formidable experience and intellectual power as he piloted the United Nations through one of the most tumultuous and challenging periods in its history. As a Secretary General, he presided over a dramatic rise in UN peacekeeping. He also presided over a time when the world increasingly turned to the United Nations for solutions to its problems in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War. Ban said Boutros Ghali left an indelible mark on the organization. He showed courage in posing difficult questions uh, to the member states and rightly insisted on the independence of his office and of the Secretariat as a whole. During his time as the 6th United Nations Secretary General, his term was marked by brutal conflicts in Haiti, Somalia, Rwanda and former Yugoslavia. This was also at the height of conflict in Sudan, where foes from both the north and the south fought in a conflict that lasted for more than two decades. After his inauguration, the Security Council met in its first ever summit of heads of state. At their request, Boutros Ghali authored the report called An Agenda for Peace, an analysis on ways to strengthen the UN capacity for preventative diplomacy, peacekeeping and peacemaking. Following up on this week, the United Nations has strongly condemned violence that erupted in a protection of civilian site in Malakal. At least seven internally displaced people died and about 40 others were injured after intercommunal violence erupted in a place many have called home for the last two years. As a result of the violence, which started within a certain part of the protection of civilian site, thousands of internally displaced people had to move to safer ground. Violence involving the use of small arms, machetes and other weapons broke out between youth from two communities late Wednesday evening. We're very concerned that the violence that started yesterday in the Malakal Protection of Civilian Site, it started between the youth Shiluk and the youth Dinka who started fighting each other. Immediately, uh, we had the UN police who came on site and dispersed the crowd with tear gas. United Nations police in charge of maintaining order within the protection sites immediately intervened with tear gas to disperse crowds. Though the situation remains tense, United Nations troops have increased perimeter patrolling while physically securing areas in the vicinity of the protection of civilian site. Patrols are expected to continue day and night. As the displaced seek safety within the United Nations mission in South Sudan grounds, the organization continues to engage with local authorities in Malakal so as to de-escalate the situation. This is a very congested protection of civilian sites, but let's always remember that those civilians have come to our sites to seek safety and protection and not to be attacked. ANMIS protects over 47,000 civilians in Malakal, while 198,440 civilians are currently protected in six ANMIS bases throughout South Sudan. Speaking after the violence, the Secretary General of the United Nations underscored in no uncertain terms that any attack directed at civilians, UN premises and peacekeepers may constitute a war crime. The Secretary General urged the leaders of South Sudan to implement without delay a peace agreement reached six months ago so that the people of South Sudan can begin the process of reconciliation and healing. In separate interviews earlier in the week, both the government and SPLM in opposition says that there's a continued need of peace and reconciliation in South Sudan. My hope for South Sudan is reconciliation, full reconciliation. Let us have peace because it is when you have peace that you can realize uh, progress, development, 
and, uh, and even accountability. Uh, even accountability. Those who would want to uh, to 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 be who, who, dem who are demanding justice. Uh, this justice can only happen if the dust is settled. And for the dust to settle, people must reconcile. Peace is what you know. Our leader, uh, President Salva Kiir, may add it. Okay is earning to see mm -hmm. coming back to the people of South Sudan. He wants to return the country to normalcy so that he begin the process of trying to put the food on the table of people of South Sudan because he wants to leave South Sudan hungry, hunger free. In our humanitarian update, the World Food Program continues to deliver much needed assistance to communities. For the first time in three years, the United Nations Food Agency, the World Food Program, has delivered 100 metric tons of food in areas which were once hardest hit by fighting. A convoy of 11 trucks arrived in Jongles Pieri area a week ago with food assistance targeted at populations who have been unable to grow their own crop due to insecurity and the lack of rain. There is no rain. When we cultivate, the crops do not germinate. If they germinate, they dry because there is no water. We have only the shortage of food. Food is not enough. We are requesting a humanitarian to, to continue assisting or to increase food because the number, the number of, uh, of people are defeated. In the next few months, WFP plans to beef up this road convoys together with additional partners as they target more beneficiaries. Uh, the second uh, 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 convoy will not only have WFP but it will also allow additional partners who want to be able to try. So it will be a much, much bigger convoy. And with that, we are hoping that that will be a new beginning. Our ability to be able to cover, our ability to cover jungle will be really much, much greater. You know, there are about 400,000 uh, beneficiaries in, in uh, jungle. And so our being able to bring trucks will allow us to really reach more in a much more regular basis. It is hoped that the road convoys will continue as an alternative to food airdrops, which have proved quite expensive. We move on to a story which highlights that South Sudan faces the risk of losing a generation of children. We'll find out why. At a regular weekly press briefing, Journalists in South Sudan's capital, Juba, were told that there are currently more than 1.8 million out-of-school children in the country. UNICEF's education manager, Tizie Mafalala, said even before the December 2013 crisis, South Sudan was already one of the most difficult places in the world to be a school child, with only 1 in 10 children completing primary school. It's UNICEF has been working with the ministry to ensure that the now 1.8 million out-of-school children have access to education. Together with the Ministry of Education, UNICEF is launching the second part of a Back to Learning initiative, which was launched in 2015 to address the low level of education access in the country. We provided temporary learning spaces where schools could not be reopened. Uh, we recruited uh, volunteer teachers and trained them and we supported uh, learners with learning material and provided teachers with materials to ensure that they can facilitate learning in the classroom. Some schools, which should have been zones of peace in the country, were either destroyed, occupied by armed forces or internally displaced people. Over 331 schools have been closed, damaged or occupied. Despite this, UNICEF has been able to reach more than 370,000 children with education services. In 2016, UNICEF hopes to reach close to 600,000 children through this joint venture with the government.
to provide access to learning opportunities for more than half a million children and adolescents between the ages of 3 and 18, UNICEF and partners will require about $75 million. The funds will be used to provide learning facilities and educational materials to the newly enrolled children in schools, but also to continue education services to children in conflict-affected areas. With all these efforts being put in place to ensure education for South Sudan's children, it is hoped that the risk of losing a generation of children because they are in danger of not being educated will be a thing of the past. Up next, peacekeepers from Nigeria receive tokens of appreciation and recognition for their commitment and hard work. 18 Nigerian peacekeepers attached to the United Nations mission in South Sudan have received medals for their service in peacekeeping. These medals are the first medals being awarded to Nigerian peacekeepers since conflict erupted in South Sudan in December 2013. The peacekeepers serve as United Nations police and have been commended for their exemplary work in the country. Drawing an example from Nigeria's struggle to statehood, the United Nations Mission Deputy Representative of the Secretary General to the United Nations Mission in South Sudan, Mustafa Samore, said the Nigerians were a good example for South Sudan. You, as Nigerian, are also a great example of South Sudan, for South Sudan, and its leaders on how, you know, because it wasn't easy to become a nation, you fought before but you came together and make this nation proud for everybody, for every African. The only female at the medal awards ceremony was singled out and praised for her willingness to serve. The woman here today, through her active duty, has shown really the female face of peacekeepers, enhancing security, and safety for local communities and in doing so perhaps they have made us as a mission more approachable for to one of the most vulnerable group of the society thank you ma'am for that peacekeeping medals for uniformed personnel are tokens of appreciation and recognition for commitment and hard work wear this medal and know that you have made a difference and be proud of it. Wear it as proud ambassadors of your country and proud ambassadors of the United Nations. I thank you very much. The peacekeepers were challenged to intensify their efforts to help return South Sudan to the path of peace and stability. We end our show with our regular Voices of Peace segment. My hope for South Sudan is that South Sudan, you know, come back to normalcy, peace prevails and goes to every home in South Sudan so that there's no anybody called uh, a known gunman anywhere. And, uh, uh, and that the people of South Sudan uh, accept themselves as, as the owner of the, the country. And when they act, they act, you know, uh, with the hope that this is their country and they have to, uh, to accommodate each other because God has created them uh, to be their, uh, you know, to be 64 tribes. It's not a man-making and therefore uh, they should accept each other instead of uh, polarizing themselves, instead of you know, uh, uh, moving away from uh, true reconciliation, you know, process. Peace is on course. No backtrack, no going backward. We are going forward. Uh, we have to implement this peace. Go to the country. My hope is that South Sudan will emerge out of these problems sooner or later. It is a question of uh, wrong policies, bad leadership. Uh, disagreement sets a roadmap for us to correct our mistakes and try to move forward with the 
the kind of reform that is in the peace agreement, the kind of uh, structures that are in the peace of agreement, the kind of constitutional making process that is in the peace agreement. All this makes me hopeful. Peace should come to South Sudan. There are so many other challenges and the people are suffering and the economy is bad. So let us have peace in South Sudan. Let us work together to create a better future for the men and women, boys and girls of South Sudan. Thank you.